Thank you very much for tuning in again. My name is Andreas Meyer, and I want to welcome you to our second part of the deep learning lecture, and in particular, the introduction. So in this second part of the introduction, I want you to show you some research that you are doing here at the Pattern Recognition Lab here at FAU Germany. So one first example that I want to highlight is a cooperation with Audi. And we are working here with assisted automatic driving. We are working on smart sensors in the car. You can see that the Audi A8 today is essentially a huge sensor system that has cameras and different sensors attached. Data is processed in real time in order to figure out things about the environment. It has functionalities like parking assistance. There's also functionalities to support you during driving and traffic jams. And this is all done using sensor systems. So, of course, there is a lot of detection and segmentation tasks involved. What you can see here is an example where we show you some output of what is being recorded by the car. This is a frontal view where you can actually see that you are looking at the surroundings and you have to detect cars. You also have to detect, and this is shown here in green, the free space where you can actually drive. So this also has to be detected and very commonly this is done with methods of deep learning. Today there's also a huge challenge because we need to test the algorithms. This is done quite frequently using simulated environments. So you use a test car on a test track and then a lot of data is produced in order to make this somehow reliable. But in the very end, this has to run on the road, which means that you have to consider different periods of the year and different daylight conditions. This makes it all extremely hard. What you've seen in research is that many of the detection results are working with nice day scenes and when the sun is shining. Everything is nice, so the algorithms also work very well. But the true challenge is to actually go towards rainy weather conditions, night, winter, snow. And you still want to be able to detect, and of course, not just cars, but also traffic signs, landmarks. And you analyze the scenes around you such that you have a reliable prediction towards your autonomous driver system. <laughs> We also look into smart devices and of course there are very interesting topics here in, for example, renewable energy and power. One problem that we typically face under production is when there's not enough wind blowing or when there's not enough sun shining. Then you have to fire up backup power plants and of course what you don't want to do is overproduction because that would produce energy that cannot be stored very well. So the storing of energy is not very efficient right now. There are some ideas to tackle this like real-time prices but what you need are smart devices that can recognize and predict how much power is going to be produced in the near future. So let's look at an example of smart devices. Let's say you have a fridge or a washing machine and you can program them in a way that they are flexible at the point in time when they consume the energy. You can start washing also maybe overnight or in one hour when the price is lower. And if you had smart devices that could predict the current prices, then you would be able to essentially balance the nodes of the energy system and at the same time remove the peak conditions. So let's say there's a lot of wind blowing, then it would make sense that a lot of people cool down the refrigerator or wash their dishes or their clothes. So this can be done, of course, with recurrent neural networks, and then you can predict how much power will be produced and use it on the client side to level the power production. 
The example shown here is a solar power plant. They were interested in predicting the short-term power production in order to inform other devices or to fire up backup power plants. The crucial time frame here is approximately 10 minutes. So the idea here was to monitor the sky, to detect the clouds, to estimate the cloud motion, and then directly predict from the current sky image how much power will be produced within the next 10 minutes. So let's say there is a cloud that is likely covering the sun really soon. Then you want to fire up generators, inform devices not to consume so much energy. Now clouds are really difficult to describe in terms of an algorithm, but what we are doing here is that we are using a deep network to try to learn the representation. These deep learning features are predictive for power production and we actually manage to produce reliable features for approximately 10 minutes. With traditional pattern recognition techniques, we could only do predictions for approximately 5 minutes. Another very exciting topic that I want to demonstrate today is writer recognition. Now here the task is that you have a piece of writing and you want to find out who wrote actually this text. So we are not recognizing what was written but who has written the text. The idea here is to train a deep network and this deep network is then learning abstract representation and these representations describe how a person is writing. So it's only looking at small patches around the letters and these small patches are actually used to predict who has actually written the text. A colleague of mine just showed in a very nice submission that he just submitted to an international conference that he is also able to generate handwriting that is distinctive for a particular person. So you can imitate particular person's handwriting using these techniques. Like many methods, you can see that these deep learning approaches can of course be used for very good purposes, like identifying who wrote a particular historical text if you don't know the authors or how many persons have been working on the manuscripts. But you can also use very similar methods to produce fakes and spread misinformation. So you can see that actually in a lot of technology and of course this is a reason why ethics are very important in the field of deep learning. Most of the work that we are actually doing is concerning medical applications. A really cool application of deep learning is where you want to screen a really large part of data. So a colleague of mine just started looking into whole slide images. This is for tumor diagnostics. For example, where you're interested in figuring out how aggressive a cancer is. You can actually figure this out if you look at the number of cell divisions that are going on at a certain point in time. So you actually also want to find out how often these cells undergo mitosis. And this means how often these cells actually divide. Because the number of detected mitosis is indicative of how aggressive that particular cancer is. Now, the whole slide images are very big. They can be several thousand pixels by several thousand pixels. And you don't want to look at every cell individually. 
what you can do is you can train a deep network and look at all of these cells and then do the analysis for the entire whole slide image in clinical routine use. Currently, people are not looking at the entire slide image. They look at high power fields like this one and then they only analyze a small part as seen in this image here. In clinical routine, they count the mitosis within this field of view. So, of course, they can't do it on the whole slide. They typically look at approximately 10 high power fields to assess the aggressiveness of the cancer. With deep learning, we would be able to look at the entire whole slide image. So this is how a deep learning approach would look like. You have some part in the network that localizes cells and then a different part of the network that is actually classifying the cell, whether it's a mitosis, a regular cell, or a cancer cell. Very interesting things can also be done with defect pixel interpolation. So here we can see a small scene where we show the coronary arteries of the heart. Typically, those coronary arteries are not stationary. They are moving, and because they are moving, it's very hard to see and analyze them. So what is typically done to create clear images of the coronary arteries, you inject contrast agent. And the reason why you can actually see the coronary arteries in this image is because they are now filled with iodine-based contrast agent. Otherwise, because blood is very close in terms of x-ray absorption, you wouldn't be able to see anything. A very common technique to visualize the arteries is to take two images, one with contrast agent and one without. Now, if you subtract the two, you would only see the contrast agent. In a cardiac intervention, this is very difficult because the heart is moving all the time, the patient is breathing, Therefore, it's very hard to apply these digital subtraction techniques in coronary imaging. Here we propose to segment the detected vessels. So we use a deep learning framework that is actually segmenting the vessels of the coronaries. And once we have the vessel segmentation, we use this as a mask. Then we use the deep learning method to predict the pixels of the mask if there were no contrast agent. This will make those pixels disappear from the image. Now you can take this as a virtual non-contrast image and subtract it from the original projection and you get a digital subtraction angiogram. This technique also works in images with motion. So this is something that you could not have done without the techniques of deep learning. The actual implementation for the interpolation is done by a unit. This is something that you will hear in a later part of this lecture when we are talking about image segmentation and where it's typically used. UNET is a general image-to-image -image transformer, so you can also use it to produce the contrast-free images to perform our digital subtraction method. Another important part that is often done in whole boundary images is that you want to localize different organs. 
my colleague Florian Gesu, developed a smart method in order to figure out where the organs are. So the idea is to process the image in a very similar way as you would do as a radiologist. You start off by looking at a small part of the image and then you try to predict where you would have to go to find that specific organ of interest. Of course, doing this on a single resolution is insufficient. Thus, then we are also refining the search here on a smaller resolution level in order to get a very precise prediction of the organ centroid. This kind of prediction is very fast because you only look at a fraction of the volume. So you can do approximately 200 anatomical landmarks in about two seconds. The other very interesting part is that you produce a path that you can also then interpret. Even in cases where the specific landmark is not present in the volume, this approach does not fail. So let's say you look for a hip bone in a volume that even doesn't show the hip. Then you will see that the virtual agent tries to leave the volume and it will not predict a false position. Instead, it will show you that the hip bone would be much lower and you would have to leave the volume at this place. Landmark detection can also be used in projection images as demonstrated by my colleague Bastian Beer. He developed a very interesting method where you're using the 3D position of landmarks. With the 3D position, you create virtual projections of the landmark and train a projection-based classifier. With the projection image-based classifier, you can detect the landmark in arbitrary views of the specific anatomy under interest. So here we show an example for the hip bone, and you can see that if we forward project it and try to detect the landmarks, it's actually a pretty hard task. With the method that Bastian devised, we are able to track the entire hip bone and to find the landmarks on the hip bone directly. So the idea here is that you use a convolutional pose machine. Here we essentially process each landmark individually and inform the different landmarks that have been detected in the first part about the other landmarks positions. Then you process again and again until you have a final landmark position. Here you can see some results of the respective algorithm. My colleague Xia Song has been working on the prediction of organ positions and what he's been doing is essentially using a 3D camera to detect the surface of the patient. Then he wants to predict where the organs are actually located inside the body. This is very interesting because we can use the information to predict how much radiation dose will be applied to different organs. So if I knew where the organs are, then I can adjust my treatment for radiation planning or even for imaging in order to select the position of the x-ray device that has a minimum dose to the organs of risk. This helps us to reduce the dose to the organs and the risk of developing cancer after the respective treatment. Now this approach of prediction of organ positions only from surface information can also be used to perform organ segmentation in interventional CTs. So the idea here is that you start with an initial point cloud of the organ and then refine it similar to the previous agent-based approach. We modify the mesh step by step such that it matches the organ shape in a particular image. So here you can see some preoperative CT image on the left and from this we train algorithms to produce point clouds. Then you can train a network that operates a deformation on those point clouds and produces new shapes such that they match the actual appearance. Now the interesting thing about this approach is that it is pre-informed about the organ shape and does only slight changes to the organ in order to match the current image. This allows us to produce very fast and very accurate organ segmentation in interventional data. So we train with a regular CT dataset, but then it will also work on images that are done 
with a mobile C-arm or an angiography system that has much lower image quality. These images are used in interventional settings for guidance purposes. We can apply our method in, let's say, 0.3 to 2.6 seconds, and this is approximately 50 to 100 times faster than a conventional unit approach where you do the full 3D processing. So next time in deep learning, we'll talk a bit about not just the successes, but also the limitations of deep learning. Furthermore, we also want to discuss a couple of future directions that may also help to reduce these limitations. So thanks again for watching this video, and I'm hoping to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.